Coming up on this week's edition of NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Are beef cattle prices heading up or down? And how can you develop a sound marketing strategy? We've got insights from the experts at Cattle Facts. Plus, see how John Deere equipment can help you put up hay more efficiently. And now, NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Hello and welcome to NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. I'm Kevin Auctioner. Every day, NCBA, through beef checkoff funded programs, works to maintain and grow consumer demand for beef. Recently in San Antonio, NCBA CEO Colin Woodall shared his thoughts on these efforts and why they're critical to the success of the beef industry. We are a proud contract with the National Beef Checkoff. And over the past year, we've been able to use the new Refresh Beef It's What's For Dinner campaign to reach more than a billion touches with consumers and individuals. Just to give you a little perspective, many of you are probably familiar with TED Talks. TED Talks are pretty famous. They bring in experts, they come in, they make quick presentations, you see them around the world. It took TED Talks six years to have a billion impressions. We did it in one. So again, nicely done, Beef. And it's the investment that makes it happen. That's why we will continue to advocate for the Beef Checkoff, to protect the Beef Checkoff, and to ensure that these resources are available to all of us. NCBA as a contractor, you as the state beef councils, all of you as investors, because the results just don't lie. When you look at the investment versus per capita net beef consumption, this is not coincidence. This is because the effort that we put into it. It's also trying to make a connection with everybody. Not only you as producers, but also to the consumers. And we're talking about today's consumers, we have to look at the way they communicate. I'm on Twitter now. I'm taking a page from the president and decided if he can do it, I can do it. So follow me. And if you're in the camp that just doesn't like me, you'll find a lot of kindred spirits in the comments section. <laughs> you have to have a thick hide to be on Twitter, my friends. But it is a tremendous tool to once again get those facts out. And the facts are truly on our side. And we're excited about what this association is doing. If you'd like to stay up to date on all the key issues and events from Washington, D.C., one way is by becoming a member of NCBA. When you join, you'll get the Beltway Beef Newsletter, a weekly update straight from Washington that provides valuable insights on the key policy initiatives that may impact your business. To join, just call 1-866-233-3872 or you can visit the website ncba.org. Spring is almost here and with it comes questions about the cattle markets and how they'll impact beef producers. Joining us now to share his insights on this important issue is Kevin Good with Cattle Facts. Kevin, last year this time it was incredibly wet. Uh, we had uh, all the snowstorms and getting a little concerned about planting. It certainly had some impacts on the grain markets this last year. What do we see as we move into planting this year? Well, I'll tell you what, it looks like we're changing weather patterns. Uh, Dr. Art Douglas that does our forecasting would suggest that we are moving into a La Nina weather pattern. Yep. And that said, that would suggest as you go through the spring planting that it'll be almost ideal conditions for the Corn Belt. You know, unlike last year where it was extremely wet, uh, he would suggest we'll have normal plantings. Uh, the USDA came out last week suggesting we'd have a, a increase in acres planted mm -hmm. as far as the surveys that they've done so far. So as you think about that component of cost to produce cattle, it looks like we'll get a little bit of relief as we go through 2020. Gotcha. You know, since uh, convention, we've sure seen some volatility in these markets. Uh, what's driving that? Well, the trigger point was coronavirus, and really it actually it started to affect the cattle futures about 10 days before the convention. Uh, but since then, you know, we've had an additional drop of about 7 to $8 on the futures. 
and the live market has gone from 124 the first few weeks of January to this week, uh, the last week in February, we've sold live cattle at 115. So unfortunately, you know, once the coronavirus kind of hit the, hit the headlines, uh, a lot of the funds that participate in ag commodities, cattle in this case, uh, wanted to sell their way out of their long position and, and therefore we had quite a bit of a drop. Uh, this particular week, now you're starting to see the coronavirus influence the financials, and the stock market has had about an 8% correction through uh, yesterday, through Tuesday of this week, and so that we're seeing some additional spillover pressure out of that. So let's talk about trade. I mean, what is this volatility and uncertainty going to mean in terms of our trade prospects in the year ahead? Yeah, it, it's unfortunate because what we're hearing coming out of China in particular with the uh, coronavirus is they are having trouble from a labor standpoint getting ships and containers unloaded. Mm -hmm. So if we look at some of the data that we see so far, pork numbers look very good. Uh, they are importing a lot of pork through the end of 19 and so far in 2020. Poultry side, a little bit disappointing, and globally, poultry prices are pretty low. Mm. And then when we look at the beef side, we're not getting a lot of traction into China, but we are getting additional traction into Japan with a new trade agreement That's there. Okay. That's very encouraging. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's always a supply and demand market in addition to all these other factors, but let's talk supply. What does the overall protein supply look like, and what are we looking to in terms of production of beef yeah. in the U.S. this next year? You know, as, as we think about it year to date, production has been larger than we would have forecast. We're looking for larger supplies all the way across the board, and we've seen that plus a little bit. We start with beef. Beef production through the first two months of the year has been up 4%. It's a combination of aggressive harvest levels as well as heavier carcass weights, especially considered to, compared to last year when we had the weather influenced uh, lighter weights. Mm -hmm. On pork and poultry, both of those numbers are up 6 to 7% wow. year to date. So that's a huge increase year over year from our production standpoint. We would still stand by when this year is all said and done, beef production is going to be up about 2%. Hmm. We think pork will be up about 25 to 3% and broiler production up about 4 So we still got a headwind as we go through 2020, although we do think that we'll see improvement in trade to offset partial, partially some of that increased production. So we've got a mountain of meat to eat our way through. Well, we've got a pile anyway. Yeah. And unfortunately, that is kind of the headwinds that we face in the cattle market today. Yeah. So let's talk 2020. I mean, what does all this mean in terms of cattle prices for our beef producers over the next year? You know, as we think about the seasonal look of the market, it's going to be different this year in pertaining to fed cattle. And unfortunately, with the bigger production levels, with the fact that you've had the coronavirus that's influenced the futures, instead of putting your highs in in the spring, it looks like we're heading closer to our lows. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a untypical or a contra seasonal type look looking at fed cattle. And with that said, we're probably going to have to struggle here for the next couple of months looking at the Fed market. Mm. In those type of years, Oaks, Kevin, typically you have a very sharp, strong rally through the second half of the year. Mm. And you actually put your highs in in the latter part of the year in the fourth quarter. Mm. So even though short term, we've got some, uh, some tough rows to hoe, sure. uh, longer term, it still looks better for 2020. You look at the other classes of cattle, yearling types in particular, they've been trading between 140 and 145, really for the last uh, 30 days, basis of plains. They could get a little bit softer for a minute in here, but generally speaking, they'll trend stronger through the summer into their typical highs, late summer, early fall. The calf market, they probably will be the least affected short term. Sure. We're going against summer turnout grass, so sure. they're trending higher and they'll stay pretty stout going into the spring. And longer term, we feel like when the year's all said and done, we'll get along better this fall in the calf market than we did a year ago. Well, that's good news for some of our cow-calf producers. But again, great example of how quickly global issues can impact markets right here at home and just the sheer volatility that we have in this industry. Absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you. Now, for more than five decades, Cattle Facts has been providing producers with the tools they need to make profitable decisions. If you're looking for top-notch beef industry research, information, and analysis, visit the website cattlefacts.com. Still to come on Cattlemen and Cattlemen, we'll examine what repealing the WOTUS rule means for cattle producers across the country. Stay with us. We'll be right back. 
For commercial cow-calf producers, crossbreeding with Gelvy and Balancer is the smart, reliable, and profitable choice. Gelvy and Balancer females offer maternal superiority through increased fertility, greater longevity, and more pounds of calf weaned per cow exposed. In the feed yard, Balancer cattle deliver increased performance, improved feed efficiency, and excellent carcass merit. Balancer adds the pounds, make the grade, and deliver the value. Gel V and Balancer, the smart, reliable, and profitable choice. Find out more at the website gelvy.org. Welcome back. Regulatory overreach is an ongoing concern in the beef industry, and NCBA continues to fight against unnecessary and burdensome regulations. We asked cattlemen and women from around the country to share how regulatory issues impact their operations. We get a lot of rain for Florida, so you would think water wouldn't be an issue, but that's our biggest uh, environmental concern we have is, is the amount of water where it goes. We're on a lake with two and a half miles of lake frontage, so we've got to watch where our water goes. So environmental is really our biggest concern. I think, you know, our job is hard enough in managing complex systems and natural resources. And so, you know, the government slapping regulations on top of that doesn't really help us do our job in most circumstances. Unfortunately, the people who make our laws in uh, Washington, D.C., and even sometimes at the state level, do not know what we go through. Well, we, we run on some federal land and whatnot, so that's always uh, got a key eye to that and keep your, your ear close to the ground there. And, and just, uh, you know, our North Dakota Stockman Association does a great job of keeping us abreast on water issues and those kind of things. We're heavily regulated in California and specifically at the livestock market. We have a lot of eyes that come and watch us, even though in today's current practices we're very transparent through video, through so many people in the stands watching. Watching. If we didn't do right by our customer, we wouldn't have a customer. That being said, anytime somebody shows up with a clipboard, I know they're from an agency. And so I go out and greet them and discuss with them what they're looking for and what we're trying to help them meet and achieve so that they can put that check in the box that they're looking to put. Uh, you know, there's a lot of oversight on uh, just you know, managing what we do to, uh, you know, protect the waters. Uh, and at the same time, uh, manure management is a, is a big deal in our part of the state. And so with that, uh, there's, there's a lot of government oversight on it, but we just do our best uh, to keep in compliance. Well, I'm so relieved we have a president who works with this on these waters of the United States. And once we got that past us and, and the tax relief that we've gotten, I think it, we have a lot to look forward to. And, and, and more so than in the past, you know, as working, doing a lot of lobbying in the past. I just know that we have to have that voice and, and work on getting these issues settled as they come up. And, and if we do it together, we have a lot bigger voice. One big regulatory win for NCBA in 2019 was the Environmental Protection Agency's finalization of the repeal of the Waters of the U.S. rule. NCBA spent years fighting WOTUS in the halls of Congress. Attendees at the Cattle Industry Convention had a chance to hear from EPA Administrator Andrew Wheeler, who talked about the harm this rule could have done to farmers and ranchers. The North Dakota Department of Agriculture's assessment of the 2015 rule found that approximately 80% of the waters and wetlands in North Dakota would have fallen under federal jurisdiction. The Missouri Farm Bureau estimated that over 95% of the state's land area could be subject to the 2015 rule. And in Iowa, that estimate rose to 97%. And in Pennsylvania, that number was a shocking 99%. This despite the fact that these and all states have their own protections for waters within their borders and many states already regulate more broadly than the federal government. Under the 2015 rule, more landowners across the U.S. would have been forced to obtain a federal permit to exercise control over their own property. And today, my hope is that farmers, ranchers, 
livestock producers across the country can refocus their livelihoods on their livelihoods instead of meeting with consultants and lawyers. And don't forget, you can help in the fight against regulations that threaten cattle producers and their livelihood by joining NCBA. It's easy to do. Just call 1-866-233-3872 or visit the website ncba.org. Up next on Cattlemen to Cattlemen, see how John Deere equipment is helping a pair of Missouri producers put up their hay more efficiently. Stay with us. We'll be right back. Don't miss the 2020 NCBA Legislative Conference in Washington, D.C. It's your opportunity to meet with congressional and federal agency leaders to let them know where cattlemen and women stand on critical issues that impact the cattle business and our way of life. Together, we can do more. Make plans to be in Washington, D.C. March 31st to April 2nd for the 2020 NCBA Legislative Conference. Details at ncba.org. It's often a no-win situation. The hay is ready to cut, perhaps pass ready, but there's a chance of rain over the next few days. So, do you cut and risk the crop getting wet, or do you hold off and watch the quality decline as it stands in the field? Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter shows us how John Deere machinery is helping some Missouri operations get their hay cut and put up more efficiently. Jack Harrison of Kingdom City, Missouri has plenty to do to keep him busy. In addition to owning and operating a sale barn and backgrounding cattle, he also has his own cow-calf operation. We keep 900 cows, about half spring and about half fall herd. We stick with crossbreeding, we take our black cows, we breed them to Horned Hereford bulls. All our baldy cows, we breed them to straight Angus bulls. Try to get some growth and production out of them. Off to the west, closer to Columbia, is where you'll find Grant Farms, which used to be a diversified row crop and cow-calf operation, until owner David Grant decided to make a change and focus all his efforts on the cattle. We're converting our row crop acres that we own to forage. Uh, we're going to set up a, a rotational grazing system and, and some strip grazing setups. and. So we're in the process of converting row crop ground to that operation. So cows are mostly crossbred. We've got some red Angus. We've got some uh, Angus cross cows, mostly using same Angus bulls, some red Angus bulls as well. Jack and David know high quality hay is essential to the success of their operations, but a lot of factors can impact production. One of the biggest is weather. Both of these producers recently dealt with an unseasonably cool and wet spring which put all of their field work, including haying, behind schedule. We were getting rains a lot in the spring, and just like everybody trying to get their crops planted, it, it we you know probably had hay that didn't get put up at the prime time. We've run out of hay the last two years in a row, so we've took on a, more hay than we ever have this year because we wanted to build our supply back up. Timing is everything when it comes to cutting hay, and farmers and ranchers need to work quickly and efficiently when Mother Nature gives them a window of opportunity. That's why Jack worked with his local John Deere dealer to purchase a W260 self-propelled windrower for cutting. His limiting factor in his production of his hay was, uh, was mowing. He simply could not get enough acres mowed down in a day that he could bale. So he came in and, and you know we, we talked quite a bit and see each other and, and that was always his complaint. He did purchase it and he's been happy so far all year. He's got his hay put up uh, you know, probably quicker than he ever had. And one of the things that one roar led to is he found out he had plenty of hay down and then he couldn't maybe bale it or he could bale more if he had a second baler. So he did decide later in the year um, to add a second baler to his operation. Our problem always was getting enough hay down in a day with the cell barn I've got and everything else I've got, I'm on a pretty tight window. 
we got this machine and three weeks later we bought another baler. It, there's two balers cannot stay ahead of this machine. It's got V10 steel rollers in it and we have noticed that it, it, it took our drying time. Oh, it cut off at least 24 hours of having to wait on hay drying. Uh, th this machine has got us where you can set the speed on your rollers and then it's pretty amazing. I mean, you can slow it way down where it just barely sets the hay on the ground or you can fluff a windrow up and turn it up full blast. It'll fluff it up that high off the ground where that air will get underneath it. The W200 series windrowers feature a fully integrated auto track steering system. This increased accuracy and control allows for faster operating speeds. No matter how good we are when we're driving it ourselves, you buy a 16 foot head and you only use probably 14 feet of it. Um, now he's getting the full efficiency of that machine and the full 16 foot width. We set up what, we, what do you call adaptive curve mode. Once you make a track all the way around the field, the next track it'll follow and you'll see a curve coming up here. It, it, it follows all the curves in the field with me doing absolutely nothing. You heard that little beat? That means, well, you're probably within 50 yards of getting to the end of the row. So it kind of lets you know, and especially in this 25 foot tall Sudan, it's pretty nice because you have no idea where you're at. <laughs> I'm on the phone pretty much nonstop. Need to be watching the Marcus nonstop. So now with this auto track, I've got it set up. I'm going across the field and I can uh, just put in my phone and I can even watch real time livestock markets going on as we're going across the field. And I really get hooked up into it. I can even buy cattle right over my phone while I'm mowing, mowing that hay down. As for David, he puts a high priority on both speed and reliability when he chooses his hay machines, which is why he believes in the value of using a disc mower conditioner to cut his crop. Well, I've got an 835 John Deere MoCo. I mean, it's just been a great machine. It's a center pivot, so we can mow a few rounds around the field and then just mow straight back and forth. And, and I really like that feature, and, and uh, it's an impeller machine. In other words, a conditioner instead of rollers, it's got impellers. And I think that does help on grass hay, especially on curing time. One of the key features of the John Deere mower conditioner is the cutter bar. John Deere's got a very durable cutter bar. Uh, what it is, it's a sections cutter bar. So if you were to happen to hit, you know, a steel post or a big rock out there, it not only has a shear hub to protect that section of the cutter bar, if need be, if you have to go into that cutter bar, you can take one section out of it out to where a lot of the competitors, you have to take the complete cutter bar and break it into half. Both David and Jack use a John Deere 560M when it's time to bale their hay. This is my fifth John Deere baler. Probably the best thing about that I find with them is I think they have less moving parts than some of the competitors. Um, I love the mega wide pickup. It's aggressive, you rarely plug it. Um, the push bar on the pickup that holds the hay kind of down and flattens it. And, and uh, the net loading is very friendly. I mean, anybody can do it. It's, it's very simple. A John Deere baler is hungry and it, it, it'll eat all the hay you can feed it. You got a good round bale that comes out of the back of it that's tight, that sheds water and uh, makes storage key. For cattle and hay producers like Jack and David, the service and parts availability from John Deere is a critical advantage. I looked at John Deere equipment because, you know, of the reliability of the machines, uh, knew other people that had them, and, uh, and we've got a good dealer, good dealer support. You know, they, uh, they take good care of us, so that's very important to me. You know, at the end of the day, it, it takes a team to, to feed the world, and that's what we're here for. We're here to support the people that are actually growing the grains or producing the livestock that are here to feed the world. Every day, these operations experience firsthand how great service and dependable equipment helps lead to success in the beef industry. Reporting from Missouri, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. If you'd like to learn more about how hay equipment from John Deere can bring value to your farm or ranch, visit your local dealership or check out the website johndeere.com. Still ahead on NCBA's Cattlemen and Cattlemen, we'll introduce you to a unique way of promoting beef. We'll explain more when we return. We didn't just design the 6M tractors with you in mind. We designed them with you by our side. 
the new 6M tractors from John Deere, reimagined by you for you. With improved visibility, better maneuverability, and more ways to customize, so you get everything you need and nothing you don't. Experience the new 6M at your local John Deere dealer. How's your production on pasture? Our profits down? Our weight gains down? What are you going to do about it? Do something cost effective. Do something that will make a difference. To add the first and proven leader in feed through horn fly control to your cattle rations, ask for it by name, Altacid IGR. It's a basic truth. Profitability for cattle producers everywhere is dependent upon consumers choosing to buy and eat beef. That's why promoting beef in as many ways possible is so important. From national efforts such as the Beef It's What's For Dinner campaign to one-on-one -on -one interactions between a rancher and consumer, it's critical to tell the positive story about beef. Cattleman to Cattleman reporter Brian Baxter brings us the story of a truly unique way beef is being promoted in the state of New York. If you've watched the Winter Olympics, this sport may look familiar. It's curling, and in upstate New York, it's hugely popular. The Schenectady Curling Club was founded in 1907, and today this club is the home ice for Team Beef. There's five of us in the Schenectady Curling Club that uh, are on Team Beef, and I'm a member of that team. As an organization, Team Beef typically works with runners across the country, and I was having a conversation with Gino O'Toole, uh, who's the director here at the New York Beef Council, and just through, you know, we were sitting there having coffee uh, one morning. It was, it was a very cold February morning. We were sitting in a coffee shop just down the street and talking, and she goes, I've got a fun idea. What if we take Team Beef, and instead of doing running, what if we do curling? I wasn't sure exactly the, basically the whole universe that we were about to get involved in. And since, that, since then, it's, you know, it's really been a very expanding viewpoint of mine that learning about the organization in the industry and you know, getting to have some fun curling while doing it, it's been eye-opening. The best thing about Team Beef is we're reaching out to a whole different group of people that we may not normally reach out to, whether it's runners or cool curlers or mountain bikers or wh whatever sport it happens to be, they may not be including uh, lean beef as a protein source in their diet. And by letting Team Beef do that, we may be bringing in a whole new group of customers. In curling, the team slide heavy stones called rocks on a sheet of ice toward a circular target. They sweep the ice to help smooth the path for the rock. Closest to the center scores big. For Team Beef, being on the ice week after week competing against other teams actually opens the door to conversations about beef. It's definitely a different idea uh, to, to have a curling team uh, representing Team Beef, but I'll tell you, we've gotten, we've had so many interesting conversations. So curling, I'll take a step back and say that curling's a very social sport. Uh, you, while you're on the ice, you're serious, you're, you're competitive, you're playing against the other team. Then afterwards, we'll sit down and they go, what's the deal with Team Beef? What's, what's the story there? And that's where we get a chance to, to talk about, uh, well, beef as a larger picture, uh, beef and what some of the beef producers are doing and tell that story. But it's also a chance to talk about lean beef is a great protein source. It's that connection when they see Team Beef and they are inquisitive that they start asking questions, well, what do you mean Team Beef? And that's when the conversation starts. And when these guys are done curling, they all get together with the team that they're opposing, sit down, have a few beers, and all of a sudden, the conversation about steaks and roasts and production, and these guys got to see that. Um, they're MBA certified, so they're able to talk farm to fork and have great knowledge of that. That all stems from, hey, what's Team Beef? What's that all about? And then usually we can spiral the conversation into, hey, let me teach you about what I know and about all the industry and maybe open your eyes a little bit and appreciate it a little more as well. There was a gentleman and I sat and talked to him for probably 20 minutes and as he left he goes, 
I'm gonna go have to have a conversation with my wife. I, I, she, she thought red meat was bad, and I'm gonna have to go have a conversation and tell her that she needs to rethink this. And so that was a really cool feeling for me, is that, like, yes, it's just one person, but hey, you know, that's one person, one person, one person, and it all adds up, you know. It, we can't hit everybody at once, but if I can have a meaningful, you know, 20 minute conversation about beef and beef production with, with someone, that's really cool. During the season, the Team Beef members curl several times a week and they travel to tournaments. In this way, they make one-on-one -on -one contact with scores of others who can't miss the beef messages on their team gear. You can't help but see it, whether it's on our jacket, whether it's on jackets, whether it's somewhere, somebody's gonna see that and say, hey, let's, you know, tell me the story about Team Beef. We got jackets, put the Team Beef patches on, and then we got them the shirts, Team Beef, because you know their jackets will come off eventually with them running up and down and, and uh, sweeping. So that's a, a nice layer. But the fact that people like Dave and the whole team can go to a group that has nothing, no idea about beef or the benefits of beef, and they can, it's a, it's a conversation starter. When they have the Team Beef t-shirts on, um, well, what's that? And then we're empowering another group of people to spread the good word of what we're doing. So this is an extremely unique opportunity for the Beef Council to have somebody else spread the word. Team Beef Curling is funded by Checkoff Dollars. None of the Team Beef members have an agricultural background, so they visited Doug Giles' farm to become more equipped to share the beef story. He showed us what a typical day on his farm is like and what he does and some of the challenges he's facing, and that was really eye-opening because while I have been on a couple farms myself, I still find, I still learn something new every time I step foot on a farm. And then my teammates, this was, for many of them, the first time they'd ever stepped foot on a cattle farm. So for them to, to see that was really cool. The Beef Council has provided us the opportunity to go basically learn more about different aspects of the industry. So if we went on the producer visit, saw basically how cows are raised and all the things that go into them. I can't say enough good things about the Beef Checkoff and the New York Beef Council for what they're doing to promote beef. It is really quite important, um, I do believe. And uh, so, as I mentioned earlier, beef producers, they're really hardworking folks. And at a practice session, cattle producer Doug Giles and Gene O'Toole of the New York Beef Council had some fun taking curling lessons and talking over the kinds of opportunities Team Beef can help to create now and in the future. This is more than just a patch on our sleeve. Team Beef is, is where we are representing all the producers across the country. Uh, and that brings us a lot of pride to be able to do that. That's, that's special uh, for us to be able to talk about beef and, uh, and talk about that message. I've had beef conversations in the strangest places and to have it on ice and, and curling, I think is the greatest opportunity ever because it's unexpected. And if these are five guys that sit down with five guys after, that's five more people that know, and they'll go home and go, you're not gonna believe what I heard today. Or next time they're in the grocery store, they're gonna look at beef a little bit differently, maybe hopefully a little more positively. Team Beef Curling is sponsored by the New York Beef Council with checkoff funding from the Iowa Beef Council, both members of the Federation of State Beef Councils. On the ice with Team Beef, I'm Brian Baxter reporting for NCBA's Cattlemen to Cattlemen. Want to learn about some of the other great ways that checkoff dollars are being used to increase beef demand? Then visit the Beef It's What's For Dinner website. You'll also find things like recipes, information on beef cuts, and nutritional information at this one-stop shop for all things beef. Still to come on Cattleman to Cattleman, you'll learn about a great company that offers year-round solutions for nutrition and herd health. That story, when we return. It started with a man, a plot of land, and a few head of cattle. That man, your great-grandfather. You've got his name and his legacy too. It's what you fight to live up to and work to leave behind. With innovation, integrity, and passion that runs as deep as yours, we'll be there for your operation, for your future, for you. This is why Merck Animal Health works. Now a BQA tip from the Beef Quality Assurance Program. 
With uh, Beef Quality Assurance and the Beef Quality Assurance Transportation Program, it's very important that we understand the importance that transportation plays in our industry. Every animal, when we think uh, from the time it's born until we get to a processing facility or harvest facility, those animals have at least probably been in transit at least one time in their life, if not multiple times. And so that stress plays a big part on how these animals react and perform, no matter at what stage they're in. And so if we can work with our transporters to understand the importance of how they operate and how they manage their trucks, biosecurity, think about those times of year where we have weather extremes, whether it be heat or cold, and how they can manage that to implement different practices to eliminate those additional risks is so important to us in the industry. They are a major part of what we do and so we have to keep encouraging you to keep managing those pieces and understanding the stress while in transit and try to mitigate whatever we can to eliminate any risk. Find out more about beef quality assurance at bqa.org. Joining me now is Alan Lee, who is the Director of Business Development for Biozyme Incorporated. Alan, thanks for your time today. Kate, it's my pleasure. So I want to talk nutrition. It's uh, really important in, uh, in pr for producers and their cows. Talk to me about the importance of nutrition in your cow herd. Yeah, you know, uh, from a nutrition standpoint, um, one of the things we talk about all the time at, at Biozyme is, you know, what's the most important trait in cattle production, and, and that's reproduction. You've got to get them bred to start with. So. Um, when you look at nutrient partitioning uh, in, in a cow herd or in a cow, uh, you know, some of the most important things for us as producers uh, in terms of getting cattle bred and their performance are, are in the ladder of the partitioning. So uh, it's very important uh, to pay attention to this from, from the get-go, if you will. Um, one of the things I like to say a lot is, uh, you know, what you cheat your cow herd this year, you're going to pay for next. So obviously very important, a lot of research uh, uh, based around it. A lot of education this week at, at the NCBA uh, was based around uh, cattle nutrition and, and, and the importance of, so you bet. Yeah, you make really great points. What specifically can producers expect to see if they, if they skimp on nutrition now? I mean, we're all looking to cut input costs, but nutrition probably shouldn't be one of those. Absolutely, uh, Kate. You know, the, the past couple of years, uh, all of us producers have trimmed down to see where we can cut some corners, if you will. And, and you know, just this year, we're, we're getting a lot of phone calls from producers where they had tried to, to skimp back a little bit. You know, their, their calving season's a little longer than it should be. Uh, their conception rates aren't quite as high as they once were. And uh, you know, that's all attributed to not taking care of business on the front end. And, and for sure, weather has something to do with it. Um, but we, you know, at Biozyme, we strive to stay in front of our producers. And you know, one of our mottos at Biozyme that we live by is uh, care that comes full circle. And essentially what that means to us is that we make decisions daily in terms of the products that we manufacture that are gonna improve the livelihoods of our, our customers and, and ultimately help their bottom line. Yeah, and you know, it probably doesn't have to be as complicated as it might sound. How would somebody go about um, just putting into into effect and, and, and making a premium nutrition program for their cow herd? What resources are available? Yeah, you know, at, at Biozyme, we've got uh, roughly 20 uh, territory sales managers across the country. We've got a full business development team and a full nutrition staff that's available to help with this. And you know, w when we're talking to producers, one, one of our big deals you know, everybody's goals are different. And that's so important to understand what we're trying to accomplish from the get-go. Uh, you know, simple things is forage testing, a service that we offer at Biozyme to our customers. You know, it's a great place to start to see what you already have available. And certainly we have multiple products that, that will fit different needs and different segments of the industry. So we can talk about that here in a minute, but certainly a, a broad offering, if you will. Yeah, yeah, well, let's talk about those products. Um, it sounds like you have something that can fit a lot of situations. You know, beef production across the U.S. is, is so diverse, diverse right. um, by region. So let's talk about some of the products and how they can fit. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we uh, essentially, we're very well known for our Vitafirm products at, at Biozyme. And, and the Vitafirm products are essentially for the cow-calf sector. And within that line, you're going to find products such as the Concept Aid, uh, which there are many different options of, of Concept Aid within that line, different phosphorus levels. We have it with and without uh, fly control, if you will. And, and so uh, a broad offering within the Concept Aid, and essentially that's our, our premium breeding season mineral that we offer. 
When you get past that, we offer some products such as the heat mineral that's really uh, grown over the past two or three years in our industry. It, it's a product that is, is very well formulated, but also has some ingredients in there to, to help fight heat stress, if you will. So uh, a product that's been very well received for us, still one of our fastest growing products and, and really helping producers uh, in times of you know summertime. And, and it works really good in fescue areas as well to offset some of the, the effects of uh, endophytes. So, you know, one of the things we focused on the last couple of years is, is producing some products for the yearling and stalker cattle guys. So we have our Gain Smart line of, of products. You know, once again, multiple different options within that brand uh, with, with or without fly control. We have wheat pasture formulas, so on and so forth. So, you know, we, we strive to produce products that will fit and ultimately help our producers make uh, money to the bottom line, if you will, so. Yeah, you know, it's, it's the old saying is you take care of your cattle, they're gonna take care of you. It really starts with nutrition then. It sounds like you have something that can fit just about every operation. So. Absolutely, you know, and, and we do have the opportunity uh, to work produ with producers if they have special needs. Uh, certainly reach out to one of our, our sales staff. You know, the other uh, cool thing about Biozyme and all of the products that we manufacture, uh, we make a product called Amifirm and it's a fermented uh, a product that's gonna increase intake, digestibility, and, and importantly, absorption within these cattle. So, you know, all of the products that we manufacture at Biozyme have Amifirm included in them. So when you can get 30% more nutrient absorption out of the products you're feeding, you're essentially making money twice, if you will. Yeah, I wish we could all make money yeah, twice absolutely. sometimes. Yeah. Alan, thank you for your time. Thanks for the support of farmers and ranchers. And where can folks go to learn more? Yeah, uh, you know, a good place to start is going to uh, biozymeinc.com uh, or certainly go, go, you can go there and find the phone numbers for our, our territory people. Uh, certainly reach out to them. We'd love to work with, with, with anybody who, who we can help, you know. So absolutely, thanks for having us and yeah. it's been a great show. Yeah, thanks for your time. Yeah. And for more information on all these products, you can go to biozymeinc.com to learn more. When we return, we'll check in with our good friend, Baxter Black. Stay with us. The only thing tougher than your hands is your backbone. And if you make a living doing this, you've got the toughest one there is. It's how you stand so tall. And we'll stand right behind you with the innovation, passion, and integrity that drives us to do what's right. For your operation, for your future, for you. This is why Merck Animal Health works. Colorado Saddlery's been making saddles since the year I was born and I'm still riding one. From rancher to outfitter and in between, if you're looking for a saddle, start here. Our best selling saddle is a lightweight one for trail riders. Colorado Saddlery's a family business and takes pride in their work. High quality and reasonable prices, best warranty in the country, and American made. 303-572-8350. Shipping's free on new saddles. ColoradoSaddlery.com. Did you know that Prefert makes over a thousand different farm, ranch, and rodeo items? And now, thanks to Prefert Direct, it's easier than ever before to get access to every item Prefert makes delivered direct to your local dealer. For more information about Prefert Direct, visit us at prefert.com. Prefert, America's number one name in farm, ranch, and rodeo. The boss told me it wasn't necessary to run these cows through a chute, cause Tex had assured him they were all young, sound and guaranteed bred. Well, Tex was one of your genuine Jippo cow traders and had injected more than one load of cows into the boss when he had his back turned. Well, I called Tex and insisted we had to preg check and mouth these cows before I signed off on the deal. Well, it hurt his feelings. He implied I didn't trust him, he said. That and the fact that he didn't have any corrals anyway. Well, Grudgingly, he hired a couple of sheep herders and they built a temporary holding pen out of snow fence, chicken wire, and steel posts. He rustled up some old panels and the first squeeze chute ever used by Thomas Jefferson. It had a Powder River squeeze and a Tico head gate and it was all the same color, rust. The first cow clomped in and I put on a plastic sleeve. What are you doing? He said. 
Well, what do you think I'm doing, measuring her for a monocle? Well, they're all bred. They're guaranteed. My brother checked them, and he can tell by the way the hair lays on their back. Well, the first one was open, as were the next seven. We worked for a couple hours, stopping to repair the chute twice. The cows were getting restless. The two sheep herders stood their ground between the chicken wire fence and the herd. They fended them off by shaking a broken plastic whip and an empty dog food bag. Well, Tex was getting mad. Check this one out, he said, as he shoved a big horned cow into the squeeze chute. The cow hit the gate just like a mortar shell, and Dale clamped the bar down over her neck. She never slowed down. She tore the head gate off and lit out for the high country. The last time I saw her, she was going over a rise. The head gate hung on her neck like a picture frame, dragging two miles of chicken wire, followed by 178 head of guaranteed bread bovine and two sheep herders waving a broken plastic whip and an empty dog food bag. I looked back at Tex and said, you know, sometimes we just get lucky. This is Baxter Black from out there. Grass is the center of our universe. So everything revolves around that. We've got to have a grass program that we can count on and plan on. What we need is an effective herbicide that can kill the weeds. That's what we need to sustain us, to keep us growing to keep us prospering. We grow our own cows. We like selling them, not buying them. I'm Tommy Brandenberger, and along with my wife, we're cow-calf producers. If you're connected with the beef cattle business, then you should like the NCBA page on Facebook. The NCBA Facebook page shares photos, news, and valuable information about the beef cattle industry. You can also follow the NCBA Twitter feed at BeefUSA. So stay in touch with NCBA on Facebook and Twitter. Welcome back. The recent cattle industry convention in San Antonio had something for everybody in the beef business. That includes an incredible trade show that covered seven acres. It takes a lot of energy to see all those exhibitors, but Brian Baxter tells us how McDonald's help fuel convention goers as they walk the trade show floor. One spot in San Antonio where a crowd was guaranteed was alongside the Golden Arches where McDonald's was giving cattle convention attendees free fresh beef quarter pounders. McDonald's, we don't have a product without uh, U.S. farmers and ranchers. And uh, so this is just a, it's a tasty way we can say thank you uh, for all that farmers and ranchers do to produce the high quality beef our business depends on and our customers love and enjoy. So uh, we've got the, our, our Mick rig, they call, they call it, because it's not just a food truck, it is a full semi-trailer. And we're serving uh, hot off the grill, fresh beef quarter pounders for free, along with our world famous fries, uh, to anybody from the NCBA convention who wants to come out and, and grab one. So we're happy to be here. We're hoping to give away as many as we can. This is the first time we've actually uh, had the, uh, done the fresh beef on the, on the food truck. So we're pretty proud to have that happen at the NCBA convention. In two days at the cattle industry convention, McDonald's handed out more than 3,000 quarter pounders. These are the fresh, never frozen beef burgers McDonald's introduced in 2018. Since then, sales have climbed. Our customers are loving the hot off the grill fresh beef quarter pounders. And uh, as you can see for all around me here, the folks in the background uh, enjoying the line. I'm real proud, happy to see that line there. And we're working to get them served as fast as they can. But that shows that word's getting out that it's out here. And, uh, and I hope that everybody who's getting to partake in the, the, the truck today is, uh, uh, is appreciating uh, and enjoying that hot off the grill fresh beef quarter pounders. 
McDonald's sells hundreds of millions of pounds of beef each year, and they have a strong partnership with NCBA, serving as one of the sponsors of the Environmental Stewardship Awards program. Working with NCBA uh, and all the programs that they've got to support uh, American farmers and ranchers is, is crucial for our business. In addition, the chain works in the area of sustainability and shares their knowledge of what consumers want today. Our customers care more and more about where their food comes from and how it's produced. At McDonald's, we are a proud burger company and we're committed to using our scale for good. And so sustainability through, our, through using our scale for good is woven into all of our business strategies in terms of how we operate our restaurants and how we work with our supply chain as well. And so, you know, livestock plays a really crucial element to that. And we're looking more and more to understand you know, as we make commitments on climate change, how do we do that? How do we show improvements for our customers and our stakeholders and our shareholders on climate change? and the important role that beef plays uh, in terms of taking care of the land, in terms of storing carbon in soils, in terms of efficiently upcycling protein and creating a, a nutrient-dense product for our customers as well. And judging by the line, a product that continues to have plenty of fans. Waiting for one more fresh beef quarter pounder, I'm Brian Baxter for NCBA's Cattleman to Cattleman. Are you worried because you missed an episode of Cattleman to Cattleman on RFD TV? Well, you're in luck. You can visit our YouTube page for replays of all our shows, which are filled with educational segments and producer profiles from all across the country. So check out and subscribe to the Cattleman to Cattleman page on YouTube. NCBA's spring legislative conference is just around the corner. And it's a great way to ensure your voice is heard on the key issues that could impact your operation. The conference runs from March 31st through April 2nd in Washington, D.C., and registration is free. Find out all the details at ncba.org. Well, that wraps up this edition of NCBA's Cattlemen and Cattlemen. Thanks so much for spending time with us. We'll see you again next week right here on RFD TV.